The Battle of Britain was one of the most unique and decisive battles in history. Fought almost entirely in the air, the defeat of Britain's Royal Air Force would have opened the door to an invasion of Britain and the total subjugation of Western Europe under the swastika. Fortunately, the British defenders prevailed in what is remembered as their finest hour. But while much is discussed about the battle for the skies, less is known about the efforts made to actually carry out the invasion had the German Luftwaffe won the Battle of Britain. This is the story of the trials and tribulations of the German preparations for Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of Britain. Welcome to Wars of the World. As the last of the little boats of the Dunkirk evacuation fleet set off back across the English Channel, they left behind more than just a beach cratered with holes from intensive German bombing and artillery. The BEF had also left behind nearly all of its equipment. Tanks, trucks, field guns, all of it. Official figures revealed that 338,226 men were evacuated off the beach, men that would be desperately needed to continue the fight. But the question was then asked, what would they fight with? There was even a shortage of rifles, leading to the now comical sight of home guard volunteers training with broom handles as substitutes. If Hitler ordered his troops to follow across immediately, there were doubts as to whether his army could be stopped. So why didn't Hitler give the order while the ink on the pages of the armistice treaty with the French was still wet? There were a number of reasons why Hitler was hesitant to give the order. Firstly, he and indeed many of his general staff felt that Britain's position was now so precarious, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill would sue for peace, making an invasion unnecessary. He also didn't want to destroy Britain for fear of handing its empire to the United States or even Japan in the East, despite his growing ties with Tokyo. Additionally, Hitler envisioned that Churchill would not only see sense and accept German control of the continent, but also that he would join the Führer's planned crusade against the Soviet Union, Churchill's devoutly anti-communist stance being no secret. This would prove a grave misreading of the situation, for Churchill was equally hostile to Hitler's tyranny as he was to the spread of communism. Any notion of the Soviet bear being strangled to death by both the Third Reich striking from Europe and the British Empire striking from the East was soon dashed as Churchill whipped his people up into a patriotic and defiant frenzy, proclaiming that they would fight Hitler's armies to their very last breath, even though many suspected that to do so would spell the end of Great Britain as a free and democratic nation. But even in the face of Churchill's promise, Hitler was still holding off from storming the White Cliffs of Dover. The simple fact of the matter was, there was no one in the German high command who knew how to prosecute such a channel crossing and invasion of Britain. The meteoric success of the German invasion of Western Europe surprised them as much as it did the rest of the world, and so no concrete plan had yet been conceived. This is not to say the matter had not been studied by German military leaders. Barely a month after the invasion of Poland and Britain's declaration of war, anticipating his fleet may be required to facilitate an invasion of Britain, the commander-in-chief of the German Kriegsmarine, the Navy, Grand Admiral Erich Raeder, directed the operations division of his naval staff to investigate and prepare a study of the practicability of an invasion of Britain following the successful capture of the Belgian and French coast. However, this was a naval study and not an actual plan. But nevertheless, it was one of the starting points from which the German High Command could begin putting together a workable invasion plan. Finally giving an invasion of Britain serious thought, on June 20th, Hitler met with Raider to discuss the issues surrounding such an undertaking. Raider was careful to avoid presenting whether an invasion was possible or not, but instead presented the Führer with a forensic assessment of what it would take to simply complete the crossing, after which he could confer with the army about the matter of conquering Britain. Raider explained that there were three obstacles that needed to be overcome. Firstly, a fleet of barges and powered vessels to tow them would need to be assembled along the Belgium and French coasts to carry the invasion force and their equipment. This would be achieved by requisitioning such craft from German industry, and when this proved insufficient, barge builders in Germany and even the newly occupied lands would be employed to build more. 
However, many of these craft were designed for serene German canals and not the choppy and notoriously difficult waters of the English Channel. This led to the second major obstacle, the weather. Raider explained that the channel had to be crossed during the summer months when the weather was at its calmest, because such an operation would be impossible in the autumn and winter. Even then, Raider warned that at least one study suggested that as many as 10% of the invasion craft would likely be sunk or damaged before they even reached the southeast of England's coastline. This gave Hitler a ticking clock to work against when addressing the third and final obstacle, the Royal Air Force and Navy. The British Army may have been on the ropes, but in the air, and especially at sea, the British were still punching hard. Therefore, it was essential that air and naval superiority was achieved prior to the commencement of the invasion. A single lone RAF Spitfire, for example, could strafe an invasion barge and kill or maim entire platoons of German troops in just a single pass. With any one of these obstacles potentially scuppering the invasion if not addressed, Raider met with Hitler again on July 11th, 1940 at the Berghof. There, he recommended to him that instead of an invasion, Germany should instead lay siege to the British Isles through a combination of air and U-boat attacks. Raider reminded Hitler of how close the Kaiser's U-boats had nearly strangled Britain to death in the last war, and that, in conjunction with repeated air raids against British infrastructure, all they would have to do would be to wait until the British people were starved into submission. This would allow Hitler to focus on his real objective, destroying the Soviet Union. Hitler assured him that an invasion of Britain was a last resort. With no change in London's stance forthcoming, on July 16, 1940, Hitler issued Führer Directive No. 16, which he prefaced with the words, Since Britain, in spite of her hopeless military situation, shows no sign of being ready to come to a compromise, I have decided to prepare a landing operation against England, and, if necessary, to carry it out. Initially known as Operation Lion, in reference to the animal which had become adopted by the English monarchy as the country's national animal, Hitler felt that the effort to cross the channel warranted a name change, and thus it was known thereafter as Unternehmen Seelover, Operation Sea Lion. As part of the Führer's directive, he gave his commanders exactly one month to be ready to go, as it was anticipated that this would provide the best period for the weather, the necessary tides at the proposed English landing zones, and appropriate moonlighting conditions. A tall order to be sure, and one that a few of them believed was even feasible. In the meantime, Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring's Luftwaffe began their campaign to wear down the RAF, attacking British shipping in the Channel in an effort to draw in RAF fighters where they could be destroyed by Luftwaffe fighters, this marking the beginning of the Battle of Britain. Both Göring and Raider felt the stress of the undertaking more than most, so much of it depending on their respective services to even get General Field Marshal Walter von Brauchitz's troops to Britain. Their jobs were made all the more difficult by their lack of enthusiasm for the operation, both believing their respective arms could achieve victory without the difficulty of supporting an invasion. All the while, they had to contend with a Führer who insisted he have the final say on all decisions, but unbelievably was already looking into plans for an invasion of the Soviet Union. Raider knew he couldn't recommend cancelling the invasion, as Britain needed to be dealt with if it wouldn't concede to Germany, but he did suggest something of a compromise. He proposed postponing the invasion until the summer of 1941, while in the meantime, his U-boats could choke Britain's vital supply lines from its empire and wear down the Royal Navy's fighting capabilities, while at the same time, the Luftwaffe could defeat the RAF and the army could be sufficiently equipped and trained for a major amphibious operation. This compromise was unthinkable to Hitler, who wanted to be on the march for Moscow within a year, but he was forced to concede that the August 16th deadline would have to be put back by another month. Despite this extra time, Operation Sea Lion was proving an immensely complex undertaking and would be the most ambitious invasion undertaken by the Germans thus far. However, frustrating matters was the fact that, while each branch of the German armed forces were given their respective goals to achieve, there was no single unified command structure to organize everything into one coherent force. In theory, that should have been Hitler, but he was often distracted by other things, or when he did turn up, he was an even more disruptive factor. With the egos of men like Goring creating an air of competition amongst them, the planning for Sea Lion was at times a case of too many cooks spoiling the broth, as each branch considered their requirements to be of the highest priority. A classic example of this can be found in the selection of suitable landing zones in England. 
the army's general staff wanted the landings to take place on a broad front to simultaneously prevent the British defense forces from enveloping them and to stretch the already thin British defenses to their max, allowing German troops to effect breakouts and then they themselves envelop and destroy the British troops. This, they argued, would destroy the remainder of the British army within days, allowing them to flood the rest of Britain, overrunning local defense volunteers and securing victory within a month. Hitler suggested that a staggering 40 divisions be assigned to the invasion, with 100,000 men being landed on their first day alone to establish the beachhead for the following waves to land with their equipment. Upon receiving the army's demands, Raider rebuffed them as unworkable. He argued that the German Navy, even with the Luftwaffe having achieved air supremacy, was not in a position to protect a broad front from the Royal Navy, who would no doubt charge into the English Channel to intercept the invasion force. Raider and his staff therefore argued that the invasion should take place on a much narrower front, where his fleet, working in conjunction with shore-based artillery on the French and Belgium coasts, and Luftwaffe bombers could provide the maximum level of protection for the crossing. This obviously didn't please the army planners, again fearing they would face the maximum level of resistance on the English coast, making a breakout all the more difficult even with the inclusion of airborne troops. Regardless, on July 30th, Raider was forced to inform the Führer that even with the revised mid-September date, preparations would still not be complete. Already, many in the German High Command felt that Sea Lion was going to be a non-starter, as the original plan had called for the operation to have been completed by then, was already behind schedule with the crossing looking increasingly likely to take place as the autumn weather began to bite, making the crossing all the more difficult. The main concern at this point was not so much the weather during the deployment of the invasion, but rather in the weeks afterwards during the effort to keep the invasion force supplied. The Führer therefore was forced to push the date for the invasion back again, but only a few more days to between the 21st and 24th of September. While the army and the Kriegsmarine argued over the details of the crossing, Göring's Luftwaffe continued its effort to destroy the Royal Air Force, the one thing all parties agreed had to be achieved. The battles over the English Channel, which Goering had intended to destroy the RAF Fighter Command, were failing, and German aircraft were continually being met by British fighters. The use of an intricate chain of radar sites allowed the head of Fighter Command, Sir Hugh Dowding, to use just enough of his fighters to meet the threats as they appeared, and thus not waste any going after targets already under attack. Therefore, Hitler called Goering to a meeting on July 31st and instructed him to make plans to extend the scope of his air operations by switching to attacking RAF bases and the British aircraft manufacturing industry. However, targets such as London were forbidden, at least for the time being. In his Directive 17 issued to Goering, the Führer stated, I reserve to myself the right to decide on terror attacks as measures of reprisal, meaning he would only order such terror bombing if Churchill ordered raids against German cities first. There was still hope among the German High Command that the Luftwaffe campaign, coupled with growing attacks on shipping in the North Atlantic by U-boats, might force Churchill to surrender, thus eliminating the need for a seaborne assault. However, this gravely underestimated the spirit of defiance that had seemingly taken hold of the British population. Through the sheer power of his personality, Churchill had reinvigorated the country and given the people a collective cause with which to rally behind, the defense of not just their homeland, but freedom in Europe itself. Such was the scale of the task ahead of them. He told the British people that this would be their finest hour. Observing how the country was rising to the challenge, American journalist Ed Murrow, who for many Americans was the voice of the war against Hitler, told his US listeners, To me, it seems that this country is 10 years younger than it was 10 days ago. Not only was Churchill going to force Hitler to have to invade, but as the Prime Minister would recall after the war, many in his government and military leadership actually hoped he would, believing that the Channel Crossing afforded them the opportunity to wipe out huge swathes of German troops, maybe even enough to turn the tide of the whole war. Just how realistic that hope may have been is like many things about Operation Sea Lion, open to speculation. Everyone in the German High Command knew that there could be no further postponement past September 24th. Through August, while generals and admirals debated and argued over the details of the plan, the Luftwaffe fought a bitter and bloody war in the air against the RAF, and the damage being done to RAF infrastructure was becoming extensive. However, it could have been a lot worse were it not for numerous failings of Luftwaffe intelligence, which repeatedly sent bombers to targets of questionable value, such as to attack RAF bases that operated transports, trainers, and maritime patrol aircraft, rather than fighters. 
they also seriously overestimated British losses, leading them to report to Goering that Fighter Command was on its last legs, despite the RAF still sending waves of fighters into the sky to meet the German bombers. Additionally, RAF bombers and attack aircraft were also making raids against the huge fleet of barges that were being assembled, further delaying raiders' efforts to meet the logistics of Sea Lion. Nevertheless, a workable plan that was something of a compromise between the three branches of the German military was beginning to take form, and as of August 30th, consisted of the following. In the days prior to the start of the invasion, the German Navy would instigate a heavy mining operation to protect the flanks of the invasion route from the Royal Navy. Additionally, German warships would sortie into the North Sea, acting as a decoy which would lure away the British home fleet. On the day itself, German paratroopers would land in Kent, north of Hythe, with the objective of seizing the aerodrome at Limpney and bridge crossings over the Royal Military Canal, before assisting in capturing Folkestone, which along with New Haven were seen as vital objectives these possessing the necessary docking facilities for follow-up transports to land with heavy equipment. On the coast, nine German divisions would make the initial landings, compromising of two infantry divisions landing on Beach B, located between Folkestone and New Romney, and supported by a special forces company of the Brandenburg Regiment. Two infantry divisions would land on Beach C, between Rye and Hastings, supported by three battalions of submersible-slash-floating tanks. Two infantry divisions would hit Beach D, between Bexhill and Eastbourne, again supported by one battalion of submersible-slash-floating tanks, and a second company of the Brandenburg Regiment. Finally, three infantry divisions would land on Beach E, between Beachy Head and Brighton. Providing the key sides at Folkestone and New Haven were captured, a second wave compromising of eight divisions, and including heavier armour and vehicles, would then be landed, followed by a third wave of six divisions. While the Kriegsmarine still insisted on keeping the front as narrow as possible, Raider was forced to concede that if the tactical picture allowed for it, additional landings would be made at Brighton, but only if the threat from the RAF and Royal Navy had been nullified. However, despite having a workable plan for crossing the channel, there were still numerous obstacles in the way. The British had by now been given ample time to erect anti-tank ditches and obstacles, establish fortified positions, and create defensive zones with their own command, control, and communications networks. While not fully recovered from their defeat in France, the British defenders were increasingly seeing new armaments and vehicles being issued to them thanks to the almost total retooling of the British industry towards supporting the war effort. Confidence was still high among the German High Command going into September that providing the crossing could be achieved, that Britain would fall under the German jackboot, but it was increasingly looking more and more difficult a task. More frustratingly for Hitler, the Luftwaffe had yet to achieve a decisive victory over the RAF. Luftwaffe intelligence continued to promise that Fighter Command was on its last legs, but while badly mauled, it was still a force to be reckoned with. Nevertheless, working on this belief, Hitler decided to switch tactics and begin attacking on British cities, particularly London, in the hopes of forcing a surrender. Hitler had come to this decision following attacks on Berlin by the RAF, which were themselves launched in response by an accidental bombing of London by the Luftwaffe. This change of tactic, based on the faulty Luftwaffe intelligence, has been argued by historians as the turning point in the Battle of Britain. With London and other cities now bearing the brunt of the Luftwaffe attacks, the RAF were free to repair the damage to its airfields and replace much of its lost equipment. British fighter strength was soon increasing to where it outstripped its losses while the Luftwaffe was hemorrhaging its strength, bombing cities whose populations cried out for revenge rather than surrender. As if this headache wasn't enough for Goring, he was also increasingly having to fend off the growing number of British attacks on the invasion barges Raider was assembling. On September 17th, Hitler summoned him to a meeting, during which he became convinced the operation was no longer viable. Later that day, he ordered the postponement of Sea Lion indefinitely. Goring continued his battle with the RAF, but by October 1940, the Luftwaffe began a predominantly nocturnal bombing campaign against British cities. From the British perspective, the threat of invasion never fully rescinded until the following year, when Hitler finally began his crusade against the Soviet Union. Instead, on the home front, Britain was more concerned with fending off Luftwaffe raids and Kriegsmarine U-boats.
A war game was conducted at the British Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst in 1974, which postulated what might have happened had Hitler ordered Sea Lion to commence. And it concluded that while the first wave might have been successfully landed, British ground forces would have succeeded in containing the German troops, while the port facilities, such as those at New Haven the Germans were relying on, would have been demolished by British engineers before they could utilize them. British aircraft and warships would have then successfully cut the German supply lines from occupied Europe, albeit with very heavy losses, meaning the German troops already in the southeast of England would have been ground down into defeat within weeks. This was not simply a British or Allied opinion either. German historian and Vice Admiral Kurt Assmann wrote in 1958, had the German Air Force defeated the Royal Air Force as decisively as it had defeated the French Air Force just a few months earlier, I am sure Hitler would have given the order for the invasion to be launched and the invasion in all probability been smashed.